Hi, everybody, and welcome to Thursdays at the Museum. I'm Amanda Harrison, a Community Engagement Manager for the DIA. Today, we're joined by trained docents Ray Henney and Cindy Patrick for a look at Baroque art in the DIA's collection. If you have questions during the program, please ask them by typing into the chat on this Facebook page or by logging into your YouTube account using your Gmail and leaving a public comment there. Christine Mark, our manager of volunteer development, is here to take your questions and we'll read them on screen. Now, to get us started, please welcome Ray Henney and Cindy Patrick. Hello. Hello, Amanda, and hello, Cindy. Well, Cindy and I are very excited today to bring a new tour, a new virtual tour that concerns art as drama, the exceptional European Baroque paintings of the DIA. The DIA has a gallery devoted to European Baroque painting on the second floor by the Woodward entrance. There are, however, a European Baroque paintings in other galleries. The Baroque style of art had its greatest influence in the 17th century, but it lasted well into the 18th century. Baroque art, art, Baroque art paintings are some of the masterpieces of the collection of many museums. Next slide, please. Thanks, Ian. But interestingly, the term or label Baroque uh, that's used in Baroque art is not at all flattering. The word's root in various languages has a negative connotation of being strange, illogical, irregular, or bizarre. This is in large part because the Baroque art was a radical departure from the high Renaissance and mannerism movements that came before it. Those artistic styles were inspired by the classical precision and balance of the art of antiquity, such as ancient Greek and Roman sculptures and architectures. Nonetheless, Baroque art dominated Europe for many years. Next slide, please. Now, this is a bit simplistic, but these three images explain the rise of Baroque art. Martin Luther, to the left, was the major figure of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. The Council of Trent in the center here was a gathering of the Catholic Church to respond to the Reformation movement. And to the right, the artist Caravaggio, who was the early proponent of the Baroque style. Next slide, please. So first, Martin Luther. Luther, a German monk, was the seminal figure of the Protestant Reformation. He vocally rejected several teachings and practices of the Roman Catholic Church. In 1517, Luther famously wrote the 95 Thesis, which is on the left side of the slide. By sending that document to the Archbishop of Brandenburg and posting it on the door of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Germany, Luther is credited as launching the Reformation movement and the general adoption of Protestantism in many places in Europe particularly Northern Europe. Next slide, please. So the second factor for the rise of Baroque art is the Council of Trent. Trent is a city in the northernmost part of Italy. Yes, that's it, Ian. The Council of Trent consisted of Catholic bishops and other church authorities gathering to address the popularity of the Protestant Reformation. They met 25 times almost over 20 years in the mid 1500s and issued various proclamations. It is what is important for us today is the decision in the 25th session in 1563 that art in Catholic buildings needed to be changed. The council focused on art because at the time few people could read and write. They looked to the church for literacy and for religious meaning which included looking to the art in Catholic buildings to meaningfully communicate biblical stories. The proclamation that art needs to change was highly significant to the art world because the Catholic Church was the major purchaser of art in the Western world. Next slide, please. At the time of the Council of Trent, the style of High Renaissance or later Mannerism dominated European art. This painting, which resides in a Catholic church in Florence, is in the Mannerist style. As I mentioned, those artistic styles were inspired by the classic precision and balance of antiquity art. 
Notice the muscular bodies in the manner of ancient Greek and Roman statues. This work by Bronzino is of the martyrdom of St. Lawrence. The, the figures, many of the figures in composition make it hard to tell what is going on, let alone, let alone inspire spirituality from the Christian Bible story. Next slide, please. This extremely famous painting of the story regarding Jesus is another example of the predominant mannerist artistic style that appeared in most Catholic buildings. Originally in a monastery in Venice, Napoleon essentially looted this masterpiece for the Louvre in Paris in the early 1800s. It just takes time to find Jesus in this painting, let alone figure out what is going on. As one Catholic cardinal wrote at the time of the Council of Trent, quote, every day one sees, especially in churches, pictures so obscure and ambiguous that while they should, by illuminating the intellect, encourage devotion and touch the heart, their obscurity confounds the mind, distracting it in a thousand ways and keeping it occupied in trying to decide which figure is what. Next slide, please. So at the 25th session of the Council of Trent, it was decided that the church should commission art that was clear, simple, realistic, and stimulates the emotions toward devotion. In other words, the art should inspire loyalty to the Catholic Church by spiritually engaging the congregants rather than simply being beautiful art. Next slide, please. The final factor in the rise of Baroque art is this artist, Caravaggio. He was a very popular painter and one of the early proponents and masters of this new style, which came to be known as Baroque. And it was characterized as the paintings having strong contrast of light, drama and tension, emotional intensity, and immediacy. The figures were close to the, the picture frame. So because of these various factors, for many, many years in Europe, there was art as theater. Cindy? Thanks for that great introduction, Ray. You really set the uh, foundation for our talk today on Baroque art. I was interested when you were giving the definition of Baroque because Baroque equals Caravaggio. You know, he was the innovator who really started that whole um, genre of painting. And so when you described it as being strange, bizarre, and illogical, that was the bad boy of Baroque, Caravaggio. <laughs> his behavior um, and his life was punctuated by very dramatic, impulsive actions. He ended up in prison many times, broke out of prison, was actually put into an asylum a couple of times because of his sort of, I guess you could call psychotic behavior. But ultimately his genius prevailed and he was always rescued by um, the upper echelons of society. So anyway, thanks for that great introduction, Ray. No, so we're going to start with uh, we're going to start with um, this painting of Martha and Mary Magdalene. And Caravaggio's real name was Michelangelo Marisi, and he was from the town of Caravaggio. But later in life, he ad he adopted just you know the name of his city as his name and became known as Caravaggio. So here we have. Mary Magdalene, and she was a woman who traveled with Jesus as one of his followers, and she was witness uh, to his crucifixion and resurrection. So in this painting, which is very large, as are most of the paintings in the Baroque galleries, as Ray mentioned before, um, we see her at the exact moment of her conversion. What do I mean by that? Well, let's try to explain it. So on the left, on our left, we see Martha, her sister, and um, Ian, if you could point her out, please. Thank you. She's dressed very modestly. And she on her hands in front of her, she's counting off something on her fingers. So she's reproaching her sister Mary for her wayward conduct. And she's enumerating on her fingers the miracles of Jesus. Since the conversion of the Magdalene was a spiritual rather than a physical um, manifestation, it created a real challenge for Caravaggio, how to present you know, how to present this idea. So his resolution uh, was to manipulate the light that bathes the Magdalene. 
and gives her this, you know, totally unearthly glow. I mean, look at how bright um, the light is on her face and her bosom in contrast to Martha kind of being shadowed in darkness. So the room that they're in is described as being her, her bed chamber. We don't really have a lot of information from the background, but that's typical of uh, Caravaggio's paintings. It's all about the light. And we're gonna be using two terms as we go along today. One is chiaroscuro and the other one is tenebrism. Chiaroscuro is the idea of very, um, very stark contrast between light and dark and tenebrism is the actual utilization of chiaroscuro into the full composition. Um, I do wanna tell you a little story about um, this painting. When <clears throat> uh, our director, Salvador Seller Pons, this is many years ago when he was still a curator, I was going to have to give a talk about the Baroque um, gallery. So he was he was you know gracious enough to come down and prep me um, to get ready for this talk because it was like quick. I only had like maybe an hour and a half to get ready. And so one of the things that he explained to me, and I've never forgotten it, he said, during the Baroque period, all roads led to Rome. If you were a painter anywhere in Europe, you wanted to be close to Caravaggio. And you'll see that as we go along. We have paintings from you know, Spain, we have Dutch paintings, so they all wanted to be close to Caravaggio. And he said, Cindy, think about it this way. If you wanted to study engineering, you'd go to MIT. If you wanted to study business, you'd go to Harvard. And during the Baroque period, if you wanted to study painting, you went to Rome. I thought that was a great analogy. I never forgot it. So continuing on with the painting, um, you can see in this convex mirror that's on our right, uh, uh, the Magdalene is holding her hand over. And it's a little bit difficult to see in our image, but there's actually a double image of her hand. So there's the image of her hand and then there's a slight reflection of it. And just in case you missed that bright light, which represents the spiritual conversion, her fingers are actually pointing um, to that light. Uh, so it's reflecting a window that's on the opposite wall. And as, as I've read and tried to distill down for you today, because as Ray will agree, there is no lack of information about what we're talking about today. The most difficult part of what we're doing with you is trying to distill down everything that we've read um, and get it into an hour today. So the reflection represents divine revelation. In front of her, and Ian, if you'd be kind enough to point out, these are the symbols or attributes of her vanity. So we have the convex mirror, we have the alabaster cosmetic jar with a sponge, and then we have the ivory comb. And the comb actually even has one of its teeth missing. So that kind of is a pointing toward the idea of imperfection and maybe even humility. Lastly, if you'll notice, she's dressed in very opulent clothing. So this also points toward her vanity. And in her hand, she's holding an orange blossom. And the orange blossom represents the purity of her spirit after her conversion. What's interesting about Caravaggio was that he used models from the street or from the lower class. And the model for um, the Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, was actually a woman by the name of Philide Melandroni. And he used her in many of his paintings. And she happened to be a courtesan. So you can imagine the controversy that that caused when this painting was originally completed. Um, he was a true innovator. As Ray said, he painted directly on the canvas, which was different than the academics from before who would do sketching and underpainting. He went, you know, right at the canvas, um, no sketching, no underpainting. And he declared later in his career that he would study from no teacher other than nature. So I guess that was part of maybe his, his big ego. Um, his dramatic uh, effect by the use of this chiaroscuro lighting and this tenebrism in his compositions is what gave them the psychological intensity that you know we we enjoy today. Um, I know that uh, Christine doesn't usually like us to get into real technical um, information about the artist, but for Caravaggio, it's really important because the thing that makes his painting stand out from all of the other Baroque paintings is something extremely unique and it was something that he kept secret. He used mixed media. So he painted with oil and tempera and he did it in layers. And the reason that he did that was because the tempera paint would encapsulate the reflected light 
in the oil layers. And when you look at um, this painting in person, you can see that there's almost a depth to, to her complexion and to her bosom. And it's because of this particular technique that he used. And he painted wet on wet, which was not common. You know, while the oil um, glaze was still wet, he went at it with tempera. There were other artists who were, who were utilizing both, but they weren't using a wet on wet technique. So that was specific to him. And that's the thing that made his painting really, you can um, really set see apart. It too. Cindy, you can really see that in the sleeve too, when you're in front of the painting in the, uh, in the museum. It's, it is, it's, it's just amazing. And it we really does. We are so fortunate to have a Caravaggio. The DIA yeah, is extremely fortunate. It sets it apart from every other painting on, on that wall, as a matter of fact. So I just will end by talking about the bad boy part of uh, his life. At the height of his success, he killed one of his companions in a brawl and he had to flee Rome. And while he was in flight, he had another brawl where he was wounded and he ended up dying from his wounds in a city called Porto or Col. However, years, years, years later, his body was exhumed and in testing um, for DNA and bone fragments, they were able to tell that it actually was, you know, he was a member of the, that, that family. And they found a lot of lead um, in his bones. So, you know, now there's a second idea that maybe he might have died from lead poisoning. So I guess that's up, up, up for more discussion at another time. And uh, if, if we have any questions, Christine? No, not at this time. You've sure thrown out a lot of speculation for research. So I, I know. And, and, and thanks for letting me indulge myself by talking about his technique. I, cu I couldn't leave that one out. Okay, uh, Ian, if you'll move to the next, please. And this just shows uh, within the gallery, and this is uh, an excerpt from the earlier slide that Ray showed. So this is on the west wall of uh, the Baroque Gallery. And in the very center there, you can see that's uh, Martha and Mary Magdalene surrounded by the other Baroque paintings. And I, I wanted to show it again because I wanted you to get an idea of the scale of these. They, all of these paintings are, are very huge. If you can see on the right, there's a person who's standing in front of one of them and that kind of gives you an idea of the scale. You know, most of them are like four by five feet. They're really, really big. And they make the viewer feel like they're almost part of the activity the that's going on in the, yeah, yeah. like you're in, yeah. the, in the room. Exactly. Okay, uh, Ian, if you'll move on, please. Here we have Saint Cecilia. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about what saints are. So saints are interceptors or intermediaries between the living and God, between the material and spiritual worlds. And in the Roman Catholic Church, this is, which is what we're going to be citing pretty much throughout most of this um, presentation, there are more than 10,000 saints. So, you know, can't know them all. But St. Cecilia was a pretty popular one. Um, it's painted by Orazio Gentileschi. He was a contemporary of Caravaggio. Not only a contemporary, they actually were friends and spent time together. And we have written... Uh, evidence, you know, that they really were a part of each other's lives, which I'll get to at, at the end of my my little uh, talk about St. Cecilia. So here we have um, St. Cecilia. She's the patron saint of musicians, which, you know, that's not such a leap when you see that she's holding a, a viola or a violin and a bow. Um, she was a virgin and a martyr from the third century. And during her wedding, as the organs were playing, the scripture says that Cecilia sung in her heart to the Lord. So Orazio is capturing that moment when during her wedding, she stops playing. And if uh, Ian, if you'll point out, her gaze is really outside the frame of this painting. You know, she's looking heavenward and apparently, you know, the music that she's making is, is in her own heart. Approximately 12 years before this painting was made, so I think it was in 1599, Workmen in Rome uncovered her burial place and they found her remains. So the popularity and the demand for images of St. Cecilia increased dramatically as, as part of like a renewed devotion to her sainthood. So Orazio in this painting um, presents the power of music to stimulate the senses. However, as I said, St. Cecilia has physically stopped playing and her gaze is transfixed above. Um, 
so I think he's pretty successful at representing the interior communication with some higher power. Um, his interest in, in this new, um, gosh, what do we call it? Theatrical realism and the idea of painting with the light effects, you know, all of this uh, was inspired by his friendship with Caravaggio. And on the opposite wall in this gallery, in which Ray is going to be talking about in, in just a few short moments, is a painting by Orazio Gentileschi's daughter, Artemisia. And in both of these paintings, it is believed that Artemisia was the model. And if you and, and they're right across from each other in the gallery, so it's pretty easy to compare. But if you look at the visage of each face, it's, it is the same woman. So, you know, it wasn't uncommon at the time for artists to use their family, friends uh, as their models. They didn't have to pay them. So, you know, they were they were ready. They were available. Um, lastly, I want to talk about the idea that um, artists like Orazio Gentileschi and some of the other Baroque artists that we're going to be talking about, they kind of lived a cosmopolitan life. They, they didn't just spend their time in Italy or in England or in Spain, they moved about and they knew about each other and they were receiving commissions from um, royalty and from the church. And Orazio was one of those. He, he actually was a court painter to Charles I of England. So he spent time there. Um, they call his masterpieces Caravagesque. I hope I'm saying that right. And they're considered to be his greatest works. Approximately 80 known paintings still exist and they may not seem prolific um, in terms of a lifetime career, but you have to remember that he also was commissioned to paint murals and, and frescoes in palaces and cathedrals. So here's the part I wanted to get to that really does uh, prove that he and Caravaggio, I guess we could say were running buddies. Um, in 1603, they were both sued for libeling the artist Baglioni. Now what that libel consisted of, I'm not sure, but we also know from the, um, from the libel suit that Orazio had borrowed a pair of swan's wings from Caravaggio because both men used them while painting angels. I think that was just such an interesting little tidbit about the two. And it shows the closeness that they had, that they, that they really were friends. So with that, Christine, um, if we don't have any questions, I'll hand it back to Ray. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. Oh, there we have, um, uh, it looks like it might be either a drawing or an etching of Orazio. Looks kind of serious right there, doesn't he? Yeah, and then, yeah, and then we'll move on to the next. And then this is just another, uh, you know, another close up of uh, St. Cecilia. So thank you. Thank you. So, you know, um, uh, Orazio and Caravaggio spent the time in jail together too, about the same time as the libel. The libel. So they caroused a little bit together. Um, yeah. now, now this wonderfully dramatic work is not only an exceptional example of Baroque painting, but of great painting in general. The artist is, as Cindy was mentioning, is Orazio's daughter, Artemisia Genelinski. She overcame difficult obstacles to become one of the great Italian painters of the 17th century. And those obstacles included the fact that women were not even permitted to receive formal training as an artist. This particular painting is called Judith and Her Maidservant with the Head of Holofernes. It was completed in approximately 1625 and it is a large painting. It's seven and a half feet tall and over six feet wide. It is considered to be the artist's finest work, demonstrating her innovation and skill. In fact, could you go to the next slide, Ian, please? The DIA painting is so accepted as a great masterpiece that it was the cover painting for the catalog of a recent exhibition uh, of Artemisia's work at the National Gallery in London. You can see our Detroit painting. It's a very, uh, you know, it's a, uh, the official catalog. So just to show you the sort of prestige of the Detroit painting. Um, next slide, please, Ian. Next month, the EIA begins having its own special exhibition centered on Artemisia. It's entitled, By Her Hand, Artemisia Jelinski and Women Artists in Italy, 1500 to 1800. The exhibition provides much information about Artemisia's life, 
But in March, uh, Cindy and I will be presenting a Thursdays at the Museum virtual tour of the exhibition in which we will be discussing Artemisia's life at length. But for today, here are just a few facts to demonstrate her success. She was the first woman artist accepted into the Academy of Design in Florence. And she regularly outcompeted male artists for significant commissions while being paid as much or more than her male counterparts. Extremely unusual for female artists at the time. Next slide, please. The story being depicted here is from the book of Judith that is included in some branches of the Christian Bible's Old Testament. Briefly, the story is that the Assyrian king Nebuchadnezzar sent his general, Holofernes, to subdue his enemy, the Jews. The Assyrian army besieged the town where Judith lived, and the Jews there rapidly lost hope of victory. Now, Judith was a strikingly beautiful widow who overheard the Jewish, Jewish leaders' plans to surrender the city. She then crept into the Assyrian camp, seduced Holofernes with her captivating beauty, waited until he was thoroughly drunk, and then cut his head off. Uh, she returned to her people victorious, holding up the severed head as a trophy. The Jews regained their courage, raided the Assyrian camp, and drove the enemy away. Now, the story of Judith was particularly popular to Italians because in the 15th through the 18th century, Italian principalities and republics were constantly under threat of conquest by foreign regimes. Judah's story represented the small overcoming the oppression of the powerful to maintain their independence. So at the time, many artists painted the story of Judith and Holofernes. Next slide, please. Here is a painting of the story of Judith by Titian, which is in the DIA's collection. Notice the grotesque head and the maidservant being depicted as a person of color. Next slide, please. In fact, Artemisia painted different compositions of the story. These two paintings she completed more than 10 years before the DIA painting are in the collections of the Uffizi in Florence and the Milan Museum. Notice how dramatically gory the scenes are, which was really how commonly the, the, this story was depicted. Hey, Cindy, um, after she completed these two paintings, I don't think she had to remind her husband twice to take out the garbage, do you? I Next slide, please. So. <laughs> <laughs> so there is this extreme drama in the DIA painting, due in part to the lighting, the closeness of the figures, and that accent of the red drape or cloth. But the painting doesn't have any of the gore of her earlier works or many other works of other artists. New, new slide, please. Thank you. In fact, the head of Holofernes is difficult to detect at the bottom of the painting. Visitors to the museum often do not notice it. The focus is not on the head or the decapitation, but the psychological or the psychology of the dramatic moment through the use of light in the composition of the figures. Next slide, please. Cindy, doesn't it appear that the women have been startled by like, a noise or someone lurking outside the tent? And Judith holds her hand as if to signal not to move, or perhaps blocking the light so their figures don't cast shadows, uh, which might be seen outside the tent. Artemisia demonstrates considerable skill because painting light in this manner, I understand, is extremely difficult. Next slide, please. Here we focus on the maidservant. Her name was Abra uh, in two respects. First, there is Artemisia's amazing technical ability in painting Arbra's head at that difficult angle, and it adds to the drama of the moment. The second focus is on who Abra is. Many times the maidservant is depicted as a woman of mature age or as in Titian's painting, a detail of which is on the bottom right, a person of a different race or ethnicity. But Artemisia portrays Abra as a comparably beautiful young woman. Now she is more humbly dressed than Judith, but her clothes are still lovely. These elements contribute to a sense of sisterhood. It's a compositional structure emphasizing 
women heroically working together. Next slide, please. So all in all, this highly skillfully executed, powerfully dramatic painting treats the often painted subject matter from a unique perspective and really is a masterpiece. Any questions, Christine? Oh, I have, we have a, a little bit of discussion um, on, on the Caravaggio um, in regard to uh, who Mary Magdalene was, but Cindy went over that she was who she was, that we know her identity, that she was a um, had was an acquaintance in in some ways of Caravaggio and uh, and worked as a courtesan. So um, it's just uh, we went a little bit over that information in the chat for everybody, but. Other than that, it's a it's a lot of um, thank yous and people are really enjoying it. So, so we can move on. Thank you. Actually, Christine, in um, some of the research that I received from our um, from the DIA library from Maria Ketchum, it stated that one of the brawls that Caravaggio was in was over Philly Melandrone. <laughs> So, I mean, she she had a pretty important. Place he was quite a guy life. to hang out with, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. We we I have mean, our own we have our own uh, um, after lunch soap opera going on here. Yeah, we sure it's a Netflix movie. <laughs> uh, you know, Ray, I wanted to mention as you were talking about this painting, and I I was looking at it. You know, earlier um, I stated that Caravaggio was masterful at creating psychological intensity. I believe that this painting by Artemisia is equal in oh, psychological yeah. intensity Absolutely. to any of Caravaggio's paintings. Yeah. And, and it's and just that, that moment. Yeah. Unfortunately, you, 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 this is one of those paintings you have to see in person because it's so dramatic. It really pulls you in. All right, Cindy, you're up. We're back to St. Jerome. So we're going to talk about who he was and um, the two artists who have depicted him in very different ways. So I'll start by talking a little bit about St. Jerome and his attributes, which we see in both of these side-by-side -side paintings. So St. Jerome was one of the four Latin church fathers, also known as doctors. Um, those two terms are kind of used interchangeably, and it sometimes gets a little bit confusing when you read about them. Um, but they were the four who res were responsible for the liturgical writings that became the foundation of the Roman Catholic Church. So very, very important. Um, he was a priest, a doctor, an advisor to Pope Damascus I, expert in literary studies, a scholar. Um, he lived a very long life um, until, gosh, I think it's believed he lived to be almost 80. Um, uh, but he is particularly known for the fact that he translated the Bible from Greek to Latin, and he also translated the Old Testament from Hebrew to Latin. And together, these uh, translations became known as the Vulgate Bible. And it was the official Bible of the Roman uh, Catholic Church. And it also, which I found in, in doing research, and I never knew before, that it was the Bible that was printed as, as the first Gutenberg Bible. I thought that was an interesting little factoid there. Um, so his, his attributes that you will usually see, it's a, it's a very, um, it was a very popular theme, gosh, through the 17th, 18th, 19th century. Um, his attributes are prayer beads, uh, you'll usually see some sort of a red garment or a robe around him, a pen, perhaps, always a book or a Bible, sometimes a lion. He usually has a beard to signify his age, and then sometimes a skull to show us um, the passing of time. So it's in the upper, thank you, Ian, uh, in the upper right and the lower left. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. So uh, there were four legends that were associated with St. Jerome, and they were called the visions, the wilderness, in his study, and his ordination as a cardinal. So here, Guido Reni, um, Italian artist, his, his interpretation of St. Jerome is partly from um, his sojourn into the wilderness and partly from his vision 
of a trumpeting angel or an angel giving him an inspiration. And this painting sort of is a, a bridge between what Ray was talking about with the Mannerist paintings, the academic paintings, and Baroque, because it has some of the, um, the things that we would see in Mannerism, you, you know, very, very defined um, painting technique, a very smooth surface. And then if you notice, it's, it's the light of day. It's not, you know, a lot of the Baroque paintings are very dark and the scenes are meant to be in the evening or at night, but this one is by the light of day. And if you'll notice, it's almost, um, Ian, if you'll show with your pointer, it's almost cut right down the middle. You know, we've got the activity of the angel on the right, and then we've got the entrance to the cave that kind of, you know, bisects uh, the picture plane. And then we have St. Jerome on the left. So he has that pen in his, uh, on our left in his hand, and it's said that that was painted with a single stroke of paint. And then on his lap, he's holding the Bible, kind of balancing it on his knee. So he's not actively translating here. He's stopping and he is talking with, um, with this angel. And let's see, it's, it is, uh, his style is a little bit less perfect because this was painted later in his life. So that's why I was saying it's kind of a bridge between what he painted before and, you know, moving toward the Baroque. So we have um, St. Jerome seated before a cave. He's withdrawn from, you know, worldly life to prepare, to prepare his translations of the Bible. But he's confronted um, by this luminous angel. And Rainey has successfully illustrated kind of the gulf that separates the mortal man from the divine messenger. If we can move to the next, please. And here we have a second version, and this is done by Ribera, who was a Spaniard, and this is St. Jerome in the wilderness. And the treatment here is, is very different. You know, this is in uh, either late twilight or night scene. Again, St. Jerome is in the cave. He has a scroll unfurled in his lap, um, you know, it's kind of rumpled, um, wrinkled. And if you look over at the, the translation that he's doing in the book, you know, the pages of that book are rumpled um, and he has pen in hand. He's actively participating in creating the translation. I want to talk a little bit about the idea of him um, wearing this red garment, which is an attribute that is supposed to point toward his ordination as a cardinal. At the time that uh, St. Jerome lived, there weren't cardinals. Th that didn't happen until several decades later, and he was posthumously ordinated as a cardinal. So that's why we see the red. It points toward the idea that he was posthumously ordained. Um, so he spent four years in the desert as a monk, and here in the lower left corner, you can barely see the silhouette of what is a lion. So while he was in the desert, he came across a lion with a thorn in its paw. And as the scripture goes, he removed the thorn. And in gratitude, the lion became his loyal protector. And if some of you think that maybe this is a story you've heard before, I think it goes back to, I'm not sure if it's mythology, but Androcles uh, also removed a thorn from the paw of a lion. So how those two, two things came to be... Um, um, I guess, tra translated into St. Jerome's attribute. I'm not sure. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Ribera. He was a Spanish painter, but he settled in Italy. And as I said, all roads led to Caravaggio. Um, he became the leader of the Spanish Baroque school of admirers. And they were called the Caravaggisti. So not the Caravaggesque, but the Caravaggisti. Um, and uh, they, their embracing of the Caravaggio Baroque style actually led to um, the later, some later paintings that were done by the artist Velasquez. So you can see that uh, Caravaggio not only inspired many admirers, but his legacy went for longer than just the Baroque era. Um, and if we can move to the next one, I think we have them side by side again. So I just wanted to just quickly talk about the idea of, you know, the one on the the one on the left 
actually is sort of that bridge between mannerism and Baroque. And the one on the right is truly, you know, Baroque. We have the chiaroscuro idea. And um, from what I read, the um, cloth that's across his lap has faded. It actually, at the time that this was originally painted, was a much brighter red. But, it, you know, over the years, you know, gosh, what, over 300 years, 400 years, it's, you know, it has faded. So um, anyway, the last thing I want to talk about are those two legs. So the leg of St. Jerome in the left painting uh, creates a diagonal. And if we look down at the bottom right, our bottom right corner, it it draws your eye up to the middle of the painting. Whereas the, the leg of St. Jerome that's on the right, it's kind of um, awkward and cocked in a really kind of an awkward. odd way. Yeah, and really, it almost really looks, it, yeah, it looks as if it's weightless, as if it's floating, and it's not yeah. even touching the ground. Or, um, or and then, of his body, yeah. Yeah, and then the surface of the um, Ribera painting really is very different. It's, uh, it's actually got some three-dimensional qualities to it where the paint's been uh, added in a, a, you know, thicker, more impasto technique. And it's said that, you know, sometimes you'll see this listed as from the workshop of Ribera. You know, it's said that it, the awkwardness in some parts of this painting might be because it was worked on by some of his assistants. You know, back at this time, it wasn't unusual for the workshop to paint the members of the workshop to maybe paint the background, the foreground, the less important parts of the painting. And then the master would come in and, you know, finish maybe the head and the hands. So we're not sure exactly which parts uh, were painted by assist his assistants, but there is conjecture that there was more than one hand that worked this painting. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Christine and ask if we have any questions. No, we, uh, we actually don't, but um, thank you for sharing all of that. Now, when I look at Angel wings. I keep thinking of swans. Yeah, swans. swans. I know. I know. I know. And, and I think it, unless they've been moved around, which sometimes they are, but I think these paintings might be on the same wall with one painting yeah. in between them. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. if you go to the museum, it, you know, you can easily do, you know, the contrast and compare standing in mm -hmm. front of them. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, back to you, Ray. Thank you so much. Uh, next slide, please. Leah. Thank you. This artist of this striking painting is the famous and highly successful Flemish painter, Peter Paul Rubin. It is also large at over 10 and a half feet tall and eight feet, four inches wide. And it's entitled St. Ivis of Tredier, patron of lawyers, defender of widows and orphans. Rubens completed it in 1660. During his life, Rubens was in high demand. More than a thousand paintings are attributed to him, and many of them were very significant commissions. He had a large workshop. Cindy was just mentioning the workshop of Rivera. Uh, Rubens had a very large workshop, and he employed many artists who worked on his paintings. Consequently, Rubens was extremely wealthy. He was also known as an intellectual and a diplomat. Here, Rubens demonstrates his originality by showing a widow and her children begging from St. Ives, the patron saint, as I said, of lawyers, who knew lawyers had a patron saint. St. Ives was known for his honesty, his care of the poor, and especially for his interest in the education of or orphans. Rubens paints St. Ives in the, with this magnificent red robe, in, which is the, of the robe of a doctor of law. Earlier compositions of this painting or the subject matter of this painting of St. Ives showed him by himself holding a book. Here though, he re actively receives a petition from a poor widow with two small children. Next slide, please. St. Ives' posture communicates compassion. He is bent forward, attentive to the widow and children. His concerned face communicates St. Ives as a tender defender of widows and orphans. And this was part of Rubens' mastery, is he would um, very strongly communicate what the particular attribute of the person, uh, that's the subject matter of the painting, he wants to communicate. There's no mystery in trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, one hand rests on a law book, that's to the right, uh, and the other hand is accepting the petition for help 
from the uh, widow. This suggests St. Ives' effectiveness as a lawyer. Next slide, please. To the left, the red-rimmed eyes show the, window, the widow's anguish and emphasizes her sick, sickly yellow skin. Rubens paints these figures life-size, which makes them and their urgency seem more real. The mother and child are both barefoot to dramatize their extreme poverty. Next slide, please. At the bottom, there is this discarded bishop's hat, which represents the high church office St. Ives decline in order to help people directly. At the top, the angel is crowning St. Ives with a wreath, symbolizing divine acknowledgement of the saint's good deeds. So you can see how effectively in the Baroque style, uh, Rubens clearly delineates the story for the patron. Um, Cindy, I don't know if you knew this, but us lawyers, you know, when we leave the house, uh, an angel comes down and, and puts a wreath on our head. But we take it off when we get to the office. <laughs> you should have worn it today, Ray. <laughs> I don't want to give away secrets. Yeah. Anyway, if we don't have any questions, Christine, Cindy, you're up. No, we let's let's keep going. We're uh, we're um, going to be up on time before we know it. So let's move yeah. forward. Well, just so you know, there is nothing saintly about any of the people that are depicted in this painting. Um, the title of it is The Fortune Teller, and it's by Bartolomeo Manfredi. I love saying that name. He was another follower of Caravaggio. Easy to see, you know, he's got this dark, you know, very dark background with very intense light that's focused on the activity at, at a spontaneous moment. So, I mean, I used to wonder and think about, like, what did people do for fun back in the 1500s and 1600s? I guess this is what they did. They went out in the street and they had their fortune told. So here we have a young man. He's curious about his future. He's oblivious to the pickpocketing of his money by the fortune teller's accomplice. Ian, if you could point out where she's pickpocketing the, the handkerchief or kerchief with the coins in it out of his, he has no idea what's going on. And the fortune teller doesn't notice that his friend, the fellow who's on the other side of the painting, is relieving her of a chicken that she has in a sack um, hanging from her from her waist. Um, it's 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 difficult to see in this image, impossible to see in this image, and it's actually pretty difficult to see uh, in person because of the very very dark. Uh, tonalities of this painting, but you know we're we're certain that there's a chicken there, and she probably stole the chicken from someone else. Um, so each of these protagonists has his or her associate or double. So if you look at um, the fortune teller, uh, her double is the woman that is pickpocketing the young man, and she's an older person. Um, the fortune teller is younger. And our fellow who's being pickpocketed, he has his double on the other side of the painting, who is a gentleman who is even older than him. Uh, lastly, I wanted to mention that they, the two men are wearing plumes uh, on, their, on their hats. And the man on our right has one, and the man on our left has two. So maybe uh, the two plumes represent the fact that he's an even bigger fool than, you know, um, he was one of Caravaggio's most important followers. And I think with that one, I'm just going to summarize and move on because we are getting short on time and Ray's got some important things to, to still show you. Thanks, thanks Cindy. Uh, Back to you, Ray. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Talk about moody and dramatic. This self-portrait by Italian artist Salvador Rosa communicates that and more. The self-portrait is about three feet tall and not, not quite uh, 33 inches wide. Next slide, please. When he was a young man, Rosa trained with uh, Rivera, who painted the St. Jerome in the wilderness that Cindy discussed earlier. You can see that Rivera significantly influenced Rosa's use of light and dark to create the mood for his compositions. Next slide, please. This painting is really a self-promotion. It is intended to create an image. Rosa did other self-portraits, each communicating a different aspect of the image he uh, created for himself.
Both the Met and the National Gallery in Washington have Rosa self-portraits also. Scholars note that Rosa was part of a trend of some artists who did not want the subject matter of their works to be dictated by patrons. Rosa believed he should be free to paint what he wants regardless of the desire of the patron. And in other words, the artist should dictate the creation of the art, not the individual who happens to pay, it, pay for it. This thinking would not become broadly accepted and customary in the art world until the 19th century. Now here, in the Baroque manner, Rosa uses the extreme sense of light and dark to create this melodramatic framing of his face in this temperamental attitude, which is enhanced by this three-quarter pose that he has. So Cindy, he is both dashing and mysterious, don't you think? The light on the right side of his face and the darkness on the left side really produces this sort of sense of mystery. And then, of course, you've got this disheveled this hair uh, that enhances this dramatic, mysterious mood. So with this painting, Rosa really communicates the romantic image of the eccentric artist, which is really a modern image that he was pioneering uh, back in the 17th century. And I'm thinking, Cindy, that for my DIA ID picture, I'm going to take a new one and three quarter <laughs> pose with light. The hair is going to be a problem, though. Well, just uh, make sure you put 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 that wreath on on top of yeah. on top of the <laughs> yeah. Go. You'll be all set. Yeah. <laughs> Next slide, please, Ian. Well, it is no surprise then. While Rosa follows the Baroque style of dramatic light and dark forms, in this and other paintings. Rosa also ignores other aspects of the Baroque style, particularly the Council of Trent's mandate that the religious story is clear and moving. This painting is called The Finding of Moses. It's over five feet tall and over uh, eight feet wide, and Rosa completed it in the 1660s. This painting is entitled after the biblical story of the Egyptian pharaoh's daughter finding Moses at the bank of the river but it's really essentially a landscape painting. In fact, as one scholar noted, quote, this painting might more exactly be called landscape with the finding of Moses. Consistent with his rebel spirit and his knack for, his knack for being ahead of his time, Rosa created a unique and influential composition. Next slide, please. The biblical story is relegated to the bottom left-hand corner of the painting. The important biblical figure, baby Moses, is so small that he is difficult to discern. Next slide, please. It is the next slide, Ian. Yeah, thanks. It is the dramatic rock formation that dominates the viewer's attention. The composition is extraordinarily animated, with elements that appear to be, you know, agitated, including the accent of the spindly trees and vegetation. It's not a scene that Rosa painted from nature, but is from his own particular imagination in the studio. Note how Rosa uses lights on the rock formation. It's the same light as same light intensity as the people. It facilitates the larger landscape and its theatrical forms to be the immediate focus of the viewer's attention and not the biblical story. Rosa accents this mood with vivid, expressive sky that is unbalanced with sort of a suggestion of wind. Uh, it has dark clouds above the rock formation and the piling up of clouds in the distance. There is a city in the background, which really adds to the depth of the painting and its fantasy type quality. Ultimately, this painting demonstrates Rosa's departure from the idyllic, harmonious, balanced landscapes of classical painters in favor of landscapes of unrest in the Baroque style with the use of light and dramatic forms. Indeed, when the DIA acquired this painting back in uh, uh, 1948, one scholar labeled it, quote, one of, its, one of the monuments of Baroque art in America, end of quote. Rosa's landscapes were ahead of their time. The British loved Rosa's paintings and extensively collected his work. Rosa fueled the later movement of Romantic landscapes and influenced such 19th century landscape British painters as Constable and Turner. Next slide, please. 
So these two paintings by Rosa demonstrate the innovative use of light in drama in the Baroque style for both portrait and landscape paintings and were extremely innovative at the time. Cindy? Well, our, our time is drawing short, so I'm going to try to get through the next two uh, rather quickly. So this is a chair of St. Peter. This is something called a bozzetta, and that's an Italian word for a three-dimensional sketch. It's made from terracotta and stucco. And it was created by Giovanni Lorenzo Bernini, also known as Gian Lorenzo Bernini, um, as, uh, as an example to show to the Pope for the interior of St. Peter's. And the important thing um, about this throne that was being created was that it was going to en encase a relic. And that relic was the original ivory and wood throne of St. Peter. So that was supposed to be encased inside this bronze throne. So on the back um, of the seat, on the front and on the two sides, there are um, scenes that have to do with different, uh, different events that happened in the life of Jesus. So on the seat back, Jesus is shown telling uh, St. Peter to teach his word saying, feed my sheep. Below the seat, um, in the front is the draft of fishes depicting the story of Jesus preaching from St. Peter's boat, which, which led to the miraculous catch of fish. Um, I won't say what's on the left side or the right side of the chair because you can't see it. So why should I annoy you with that? Um, but it's about two feet tall. It's in a vitrine in the Baroque gallery. So, you know, if you get down to the DIA, you can get a better look at it. Um, he was, um, as I said, commissioned to design this throne and this was one of several models that he created, but this is the only known model that still exists. He presented this model to his patron, uh, the Pope, on Palm Sunday in April of 1658. And the finished bronze chair is now the focal point of the apse in St. Peter's. And so if we'll move to the next slide, we'll see an interior of St. Peter's by the artist Giovanni Panini. This is a huge painting. It's not in our Baroque gallery. It's actually up in our Italian suite of galleries. Um, and it, it uh, kind of is a good example of something that was happening, uh, you know, about a hundred, uh, you know, about a hundred years after the Baroque period, we had something starting that was called the Grand Tour. And so uh, young men who were from wealthy families primarily from um, England, but later on through other parts of Europe, um, they would be sent on these travel sojourns to complete their education. And they would travel with tutors and artists and protectors, and they would go and see the sites of Italy. And so they wanted something to take back with them as a memento or as a souvenir. So Panini was famous for creating these landscapes which were kind of lovingly called veduta, which means postcards. And, you know, the commissions, you know, came, came, you know, he painted this same scene uh, approximately 30 times. Um, the DIA's painting, though, is particularly interesting because it's not a straight on perspective. If you notice, the, the very back of um, the cathedral is kind of shifted over to the left. So it creates a little bit more interest. And the uh, another point that I would like to make is that some of the, the uh, monuments and some of the, the uh, icons that are in this painting actually help date it to 1750 because they weren't installed until that time. So at the very rear of the church, it's very difficult to see in this image, there's something called a baldacchino. What is a baldacchino? This was also created by Bernini. Um, and it was a kind of a throne for the throne. Um, a baldacchino was a canopy that's held up by four poles. Uh, his baldacchino was a carved from wood and the four posts were uh, carved um, with a twist going up. It's absolutely phenomenally beautiful, gigantic, very tall, and the throne sits inside of it. But at the very, very back, you can see this little glowing yellow kind of form. That is a stained glass window. And in the middle of that kind of honey colored glass, there's a dove. And when the light shines through it, it just creates, it's almost like a spotlight into the space today. I mean, if you happen to visit today, it's like a spotlight. So in the foreground, we have the pilgrims, 
they're kneeling in devotion. Um, if you could see the see this um, in person up close, you would know that they're all very well dressed. These are not, you know, these are not the people of the street or from the lower class. These are the tourists, the grand tourists. And on the two sides of the painting, we have people who are standing. They're actually looking at the architectural elements of the building. They're really not interested in, in the devotional aspect of it, may not even be of, of that religion. Uh, and with that, I think we'll close. Um, do we have enough time, Ray? To, do you think you can wrap up? No? Okay, you want me to do the closing? Please, yes, okay. please do the Please do okay. the closing. Oh, oh I just I wanted to mention that I, I just wanted to mention that that painting that it was a postcard is not a postcard. It is no. huge. It's, it's gigantic. A huge painting. Yeah, it is. It's gorgeous. Gigantic. And it, it's it's quite a reminder. Anyway, go ahead, Cindy. Yep. Thank you, Ray. Uh, so to summarize our talk today on Baroque art and the DIA's um, artist theater gallery. Um, in this 17th century European art, people were made to look like actors on a stage. They were life-sized. They had emotional facial expressions, grand postures, emphatic hand gestures, which led to, you know, what we kept talking about, that, that psychological kind of spontaneous, you know, just grabs you. Um, and then spotlighting, very bright light against deep shadow. And as Ray said in the opening, this dramatic art met the needs of the church. After Protestant groups had splintered away, the Catholic Church worked to defend, reinforce, and spread its beliefs. The Catholic Church commissioned art to appeal to believers' emotions. The theatrical style swept all through Europe. Intense artistic rivalries erupted. And as this new dramatic style called Baroque became embraced more widely, it was reflected throughout much of 17th century Europe. And, um, you know, I don't know if everyone out there knows this, and, you know, I think I probably had forgotten it, but the Baroque collection of the DIA is one of the most complete collections of Baroque art in the world. So it's one more claim to fame um, for our magnificent museum. And then I, one last it, thing it I wanted to say. It, it was popular. It was very popular art. And it popular was, to, yep. uh, to collect. Yep. Um, the 17th century was also known as the 17th century of genius. And I just wanted to add this as a little aside. So these are some of the geniuses who existed in the 17th century. Caravaggio, Shakespeare, Vermeer, Poussin, René Descartes, Galileo, Sir Isaac Newton, and Rembrandt. I mean, can you imagine living in Europe at this time, the energy and the genius that was going on? It must have been a wonderful place a wonderful place to be. So thank you everyone for joining us today. The DIA is open. We invite you to plan your visit by reserving a timed entry ticket via the DIA website. Uh, we're open Tuesday through Thursday, nine to four, Fridays from nine to nine, and Saturday and Sunday from 10 to five. Ray and I would like to thank uh, Amanda Harrison, Chris Mark, and Ian Ripnicki for helping produce today's talk. We also would like to give a shout out to our teammate, Jim O'Malley, whose place I was taking today. He's a little under the weather. Hope that I, I did him proud in his place. He'll be back soon, folks, for all of you Jim O'Malley fans. And our TA, uh, Thursdays at the Museum, or TATM as we call it, will be on hiatus next Thursday, returning January 27th. And the topic will be women artists and musicians in the 15th through the 18th century. So it will really be kind of a nice book bookend to our talk today. And then next Monday at one o'clock, which is January 17th, in honor of Martin Luther King, uh, the Detroit Film Theater will present King, a filmed record, Montgomery to Memphis. So hopefully um, you can join us for that. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we always love to do our, our Thursday at the Museum talks. And Ray, it was great working with you today. Thank always you. a pleasure, Cindy. Take care.